Welcome to Story Talk, a roundtable discussion of a single short story at a time. Story Talk is a production of One Week Critique, an Iowa based arts and education nonprofit that offers educational resources and editorial support to students and teachers of the literary arts. You can learn more about us and our programs or support our work by visiting our Patreon page or by going to our website, oneweekcritique.com. It's the number one week critique.com. I'm Ingrid Wensler, here today with fellow editor friends, Matthew Schmidt. Hello. And Adam Alsergani. Welcome. Hi. Today we'll be discussing the title story of The Pomegranate Lady and Her Sons, a collection by Goli Tarahi, translated from Persian by Sarah Khalili, and published by W.W. W. Norden in 2013. This story begins as a line in italics that its opening announces, the Mirabid Airport, Tehran. With its two main characters, the story's unnamed narrator and an old woman, Anar Banu Shanari, Mama Pomegranate, who move through the airport's bureaucratic checks and board Air France Flight 726. The basic premise and plot points are simple maybe deceptively so. The narrator is leaving Tehran, where she's from and at the store's outset is anxious in a way she can't explain to herself. A wanderer for all her comings and goings, she's familiar with, but still not accustomed to or comfortable with airports, with flights, and perhaps most significantly with taking leave of the city she's thought of as home. At the airport, the narrator's suitcase is flagged by security. The battle axe she's brought for her son, apparently part of the paraphernalia dervishes carry, is deemed a murder weapon. In the midst of the bureaucratic kerfuffle caused by this weapon, an old woman on our venue appears and presents the first of her problems. She needs help with her customs form. We find out as the story moves along that Anna Benu is from a is um, is from a village in the Yast province in central Iran. She's 83 years old. Her husband was rec- her husband has recently died, and she's going to see her two sons, who she hasn't seen in 10 years. They live in Sweden now. The trouble is she hasn't ever left her village. Her body's old, stiff. And she's mystified by how to move through an airport, how to travel at all. She befriends the narrator and insists on her help. Sits next to her on what's her first flight, the narrator's only flight, and talks incessantly, takes off her shoes, falls in the aisle, eats some of the narrator's breakfast. When the plane lands and she needs to transfer, the narrator, tired of travel and in a hurry, tries to leave this old woman behind. The old woman can't move. Her legs are stiff from the flight. She doesn't know what to do and just stays where she is, sitting on the floor. A man follows the narrator, explains the situation, and the narrator begrudgingly goes back to help on her family, or Mama Pomegranate, as she calls her. All the while, we learn more about Honor Banu, her family, her village, her wishes for her son, and this visit ahead. Um, I think that pretty well covers it. What do you two think? Yeah, that is a very thorough... A long summary. Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess to start out, um, I'm hoping we can talk first about the unnamed narrator. Um, what do we know about her, and why leave her not unnamed? Well, uh, she is a regular person. Uh and she lives in France, uh, possibly Paris, possibly outside of Paris, uh, or at least France is her final destination. Um, she is uh, from 
Iran at least before she lived in Paris is the kind of feel that I get because she does say a lot of things like, you know, leaving your homeland and, and things like this, although it's kind of vague uh, on that point. Uh, we know that she's in a hurry and she would really rather not uh, help Mama Pomegranate. Um, but, you know, she's kind of wrangled into doing so. Yeah, I think all of that's pretty accurate to the situation, right? Like, we don't actually get a lot of history from the unnamed narrator. Um, and we do occasionally learn things about the unnamed narrator that I, you know, we can assume are reasonably true, right? We do get a mention that the, the battle axe murder weapon is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a gift for her son, presumably. Um, and Mama Pomegranate later is going to ask about whether or not she has kids when she's telling stories about her own children who have taken off to Sweden. Um, and the unnamed narrator tells us that she does, or she tells Mama Pomegranate that she does. Um, she never says explicitly that she's Iranian, but uh, to Matthew's point, she there's inferences about it in her thinking around that leaving Tehran in particular um, and missing it and feeling sort of, uh, I feel like alienated sort of the cliched term, but I th think it's also true to the story that we're discussing. Um, and to your question about why leave her unnamed, uh, I think that, um, I hope we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but I think more than a little bit, this story, um, or the heart of the story, and it's sort of like, uh, you know, in its pathos, uh, is rooted in both the desire to to leave the homeland and go into some place that is new and unexplored and is exciting, um, which in this case, I think there's a lot of interaction with the, the West as part of that question um, and non-Muslim spaces as part of that question. Ramadan Mubarak, by the way. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that a lot of what's important about not knowing the narrator's name is both that there's a little bit of like self-indulgence and self-importance on Mama Pomegranate's part um, in that like she doesn't actually ask the unnamed narrator much about herself. And so the unnamed narrator becomes a functionary in Mama Pomegranate's story. And also I think that a lot of what we're getting into is the anonymity of a more cosmopolitan world, right? Um, later on in the story, we're going to hear the unnamed narrator explain to Mama Pomegranate that she need not be embarrassed by her predicament because in the West, nothing is embarrassing, um, right? But nothing's embarrassing in the West because no one gives a damn about you. And I think that's, you know, for someone who's never left her relatively small village and who has a whole legend around her life in that village, um, you know, that's a sincerely disturbing fact. Yeah, um, my undergrad professors used to joke too about um, her family always reading themselves into her stories. Um, she could kill a younger woman and um, her mom would call her up and say, why did you kill me in that chapter? Um, oh. I think there's also a little bit of that at work with the unnamed, um, kind of teasing readers and almost like perhaps baiting them to think that, you know, this is the author writing her own story that perhaps there is a mama pomegranate and adds <laughs> that dimension as well. Yeah, yeah. I think. Um, so for a story that, I mean, actually has kind of 
not so many main characters in its present tense or like sort of mirrored a present tense action. Um, there are a ton of secondary characters that do get mentioned. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of those characters, especially the ones that we learn about through Anar Banu or Mama Pomegranate. Um, who does she tell us about? Oh man, Mama Pomegranate tells us about everybody in the village of Yaz eventually. Um, but I think, you know, I'm going to start there, right? So, Mama Pomegranate tells us a little bit about her husband, who's usually a little bit disgruntled about uh, the sons, right? Um, and she has two sons, an older one and a younger one, who she describes in various ways and various terms. Uh, but in general, her older son is a little angry. Clearly, he had um, he got involved in revolutionary activities, uh, although you know, and he spent some time in jail as a result of that. And now that he's in the West, um, has been a little, uh, cranky to say the least. He still seems like he wants to take revenge for, um, certain things that happened during the revolutionary period, but he's also maybe, uh, religiously motivated to at least claim that he would like to kill people, uh, who, um, have done this and that. The younger son is a musician, seems to be a little more mellow. It keeps coming up that he's effeminate in different ways, which is a bit of a distress to the father, um, as are the, the skinny uh, European women uh, that have found their way into his son's lives. Um, at one point, he actually tears up a picture of a daughter-in-law, and I think, I can't. does he spit on it and then tears it up? Um, something like that yeah, yeah. Uh, we also hear about Sohila Hanom uh, who is a school teacher in the village and she gives a lot of um, I would say dubious information to Mama Pomegranate um, but also helps Mama Pomegranate because you know it's a, a long trip from Yaz to Tehran where she has to uh, get her flight and so she stays with Sohela's uh, brother, for instance. Um, we hear about a little bit about a village elder um, who's worried about her. Um, and obviously, you know, loosely the sort of daughter-in-laws that I mentioned. Um, those are, I think, probably the key mama pomegranate uh, intros, but you might also have some Mr. Parrot and such. <laughs> yeah, those are, yeah. I mean, Colonel Zamani, uh, gets mentioned but i wouldn't say he's a big part i think you covered that already with the elder son basically um and yeah mr parrot uh is not brought up by mama pomegranate but uh she does meet him early in the story he happens to be the official that has to come look at the axe that our narrator is carrying in her suitcase and you know, he's kind of like a little boy, uh, as described in the story. And apparently this old battle axe is, is an antique, at least uh, the head of the axe. The hilt is newly made. And, you know, one of the things is that they think it's a weapon of violence, even though the narrator is simply just taking it as a gift for her son and bought it cheaply in a shop uh, for that purpose. So regardless, she has to leave the axe in the airport, uh, but there's a whole ordeal around that. And of course, the, I guess, important part about Mr. Parrot is that his name's Mr. Parrot. Uh, and this story is about repetition, if nothing else. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that gives me a good transition to my next question. Uh, so staying with these secondary characters a little bit longer, uh, I'd say I completely agree this is a story about repetition. Um, 
it's also a story about traveling through an airport with a stranger. And it's about travel and liminal spaces more broadly. Um, how, how do the secondary characters, characters that we never meet in the present or a more present tense scene, um, help shape the story's presentation of place and of travel in particular? Well, we, we meet uh, the majority of these characters, as we've said, through Mama Pomegranate, and we get them uh, through waiting periods, meaning whether it's in line at one of the airport's terminals uh, or waiting to get on the flight, on the flight, after the flight when they're in uh, Charles de Gaulle, um, you know, Mama Pomegranate kind of introduces these characters to explain, you know, what she's thinking and also like why she's feeling the way she's feeling. She also, I think, is trying to relate to the narrator uh, who doesn't really want to relate with her in that, you know, travel is stressful in general. The airport is stressful and you know, we spend a lot of time with the narrator at the beginning talking about how stressful the airport is, the long lines, the people that are sad that are leaving, the people that are sad that their friends or relatives are leaving, um, the divisions the, of those people, uh, the searches of their baggage, etc. We could go on and on about that. Um, but it's also kind of a thing where uh, Mama Pomegranate like is trying to maybe cheer her up in a, in a way that's not a way that's acceptable kind of to this unnamed narrator. And that is, you know, telling stories. Uh, it is also a way to get the narrator to help her. She continuously says, you know, I'd give my life for you. And she says this in order for the narrator to help fill out her uh, paperwork at the beginning uh, because not very many people apparently will either A, help Mama Pomegranate or can write in Persian. Um, and she's also trying to say, hey, I think you're a mother. I am a mother. <laughs> yeah. And I am trying to see my sons who I haven't seen in at least a decade. And I really need help. I don't know French. I can't talk to these people. I don't know how to get around the French airport. Uh, I'm old and I have all these ailments. It's hard for me to walk. Like, please just help me, you know, get through this. Yeah, I think that um, Matthew's giving a pretty good assessment of sort of the psychological space that's going on. And in that way, maybe the way I've been thinking about this is a little bit about the two kinds of space or, you know, this is going to be a, like sort of arbitrary division and sort of not arbitrary division um, to say that in the story, there are literalized spaces, right? Charles de Gaulle airport is a literalized space. It has a location on earth and, and one can be in it. Um, that said, uh, if you've never been to Charles de Gaulle, uh, you're not getting a sort of deep portrait of the details of Charles de Gaulle, nor for that matter, you know, the airport in Tehran, nor for that matter, Paris or Sweden or even Yazd. Right. Like we don't learn that much about spaces visually. You couldn't map a space in the way that you could if you were reading, say, like Paul Auster's New York trilogy, uh, which is really obsessed with that stuff. Uh, nor, you know, is there a sort of like Tolstoy-esque sort of this is what's in the room, like um, not very much of it anyway. Right. People become much more the focus of the story. And that way, I think that um, what we learn a lot more about is cultural spaces and how cultural spaces interact and influence us, right? Yazd becomes, as much as anything, 
this sort of imaginative space in the mind, um, as does, right, like the country of Iran, which is both a literalized space, right? You could go to a place that is politically designated as this is Iran beginning and end, um, and interact with its sort of geographical features, um, its political features, and so on and so forth. Um, but then there's this thing of being Iranian or Persian and being elsewhere in the import of that. And this idea of, right, the better and worse spaces within that, right? The fantasy that the unnamed narrator has is that both that she is somehow apart from and above some of these things, right? I don't know if this is a translation um, or a matter of translation or if it's a, a specific point that the author is trying to make. The description of what the narrator is wearing is a coverall, right? Which is how she's describing, uh, you know, the appropriate Islamic uh, wear for women. Um, and that narrator almost immediately is pissed off at a guy who wants a tip and he's hurrying. She's making judgments about his behavior in order to get a tip when he's helping carry her bags. And she's irritated with the quality of service and the way that that works. She's irritated with Mama Pomegranate throughout the story for interrupting her, for not understanding the processes, the sort of bureaucratic mechanisms of getting on an airplane and moving through the world. And ultimately, until the end of this story, there isn't a great deal of sensitivity on the part of the narrator for Mama Pomegranate. She is more dealing with a nuisance and like guilt than she is empathizing with Mama Pomegranate. It's through that repetition that Mama Pomegranate is being heard. And it's only after the narrator has fucked up and like realizes she may have incidentally hurt someone in her insistence on moving forward that like she hasn't created. And even that way, she pays a guy to help Mama Pomegranate get on to the appropriate airport bus to get her to Sweden so that she can get home a little bit faster. She's our, the narrator's already reached her destination. I, I litany all of those things to say that there is, right, like, and all of us have these sort of fantasies, right, um, that if you come from a small place and you feel enclosed by this, this space, often you develop an imagination that the real life is happening elsewhere in that bigger environment and that other environment and that more dominant economic sort of politically hegemonic environment of Europe and the West and America, right? But also those spaces can be really scary, right? Um, someone from, I can't remember if it's the, the elder or the village of Yazd or if it's uh, the school teacher tells Mama Pomegranate, it might be her husband also, somebody says that America is evil um, and that the kids shouldn't, the sons of Mama Pomegranate shouldn't go there. It's the husband, yeah. It's the husband, yeah, yeah. That there's that that fear element, but also there is a literal changing that happens, right? And some of that's right. I think as Western people, we tend to think of that as like social conservatism, um, but also that social conservatism has a grounding that the unnamed narrator wants to look back to, and so she wants to right be, to be able to appropriate the battle axe. And when there's a mistake, we learn something real about the culture of Tehran in 2000, wherein like someone taking antiquities out of the country can be solved as simply as handing it off to someone else in the airport without, you know, the bureaucrats actually doing anything other than using the term murder weapon, which may only be, right, problematic to the narrator because of the way she's receiving it personally and maybe of no consequence to anyone else. So we're learning real kind of like, you know, operations of world stuff. Um, but there's also that, that huge conflict between who I am as a Westerner and who I am as 
right, an Easterner, or in this case, for the unnamed narrator, an Iranian. Yeah, I think the two of you have captured this uh, so perfectly. Um, you know, I think the story actually, in a lot of ways, is a kind of hard one to talk about because of how it deals with space and place. Um, you know, I think the Tolstoy approach of, you know, telling you the objects in a room is, is kind of differently grounded. But, um, you know, I, I think one connection that I hear you two making between place and travel and how the two get depicted um, is that travel is, is presented as very bureaucratic and as, you know, even oppressive to those who are familiar with it. And I mean, in a lot of ways, in Ukraine, I know Kafkaesque gets tossed around a lot, but I mean, it truly is a kind of Kafka space that they're moving through these airports. Um, and, you know, I think, Adam, what you said about place being kind of psychological in the story, um, I, I think really gets, gets right how these characters are relating to place. And, I mean, uh, uh, some of the secondary characters help us see the kind of character of Mama Pomegranate's village and the sort of space it is and the ways in which it's at once a space where people really care for each other, very opposite the airport, but a little backward in certain ways. Um, you know, there's this wonderfully hilarious moment where um, everyone thinks that Sweden is in northern Iran. But then we find out that the narrator also doesn't really know where Mama Pomegranate is going in Sweden. And there are these kind of lovely echoes between, you know, is this place backward and in what ways? And, um, you know, one thing I noticed immediately about both the narrator and Mama Pomegranate, this kind of link between them, is they both miss Iran at the airport before they've left it. Um, and I, I think there's something really key there about how the story understands space. Um, but I'm babbling and I wanna talk about Mr. Parrot. Okay. Early on, especially um, the action, even the reported orality in this story emphasizes repetition, like we've already talked about a little. The porter's hurry transfers to the narrator um, Mr. Parrot, the airport official who's page to examine the battle axe, is named Mr. Parrot. Um, someone else mimics the parrot, repeating a word. Honor Bonu, um, the pomegranate woman, um, appears and repeats certain phrases. Um, she calls the narrator, dear lady, again, again. Um, so I wonder, do you think, is, is repetition in the story multivalent uh, functioning in different ways at different times yes <laughs> uh, no, I, totally I like that's the answer i was hoping <laughs> no i think you know matthew hit on a key one early on right like by saying that there is a there's a sort of like utilitarian reason to niggle people right like um that like sometimes the niggling gets you what you want. So in the case of Mama Pomegranate, she's like, she's like wheedled the narrator into like helping her out well above and beyond the narrator's desire to do so. Um, some of that repetition is politeness, right? Like I don't really know you. I know you're helping me out, so I'm calling you, dear lady, or sir or madam or whatever you know translated into your own life and experiences as you will in the times you know professor so and so or whatever you know um i think there's also right like something about the difference i've been digging on some john dewey lately and he has this great moment where he's talking out the concept of experience and he thinks of experiences as needing to be sort of 
hermetically sealed, right, to make that loop complete, to be processable as events or sets of events. Whereas, right, like many of us sort of in a Western condition do thing A and we do thing B and we do thing C and we try and create the idea in our own heads of like the meaning after the fact. And sometimes it can be hard because we aren't sort of aiming toward anything. Um, that said, right, like the process of being a mother and the importance of being a mother and the things that children can do to you in this world, to quote Mama Pomegranate, um, can be real obsessions if your life is in a sort of oversimplified context, right? It isn't as like ephemeral and fleeting and sort of depressingly useless as trying out every new bar in like the city that you live in because you tried all the other bars. But it does have this different sort of like claustrophobic feeling of like not having anything to talk about except the event of going to Sweden and the school teacher in the town who told you the thing who's your like your main sort of link to the world now that your sort of like crotchety husband has passed away and so on and so forth. So I think there's a real world effect and something, you know, the verisimilitude of capturing the feeling of hearing mama pomegranate repeat her anxiety <laughs> over and over. I like, I get very nervous reading this story truth told because of that effect. Yeah, um, no, I agree. I honestly, I feel bad when I read the story. Uh, and I think that's what the story is trying to do. Uh, yeah. Like the anxiety level just shoots through the roof because he, the unnamed narrator is also like you, the reader. It's like saying, hey, what would you do if, you know, your country person was like, hey, I need your help. And they're just going to do everything they can in, in as kind of a way as they know how to ask for your help. Are you going to give in, uh, so to speak, and help the person? Or are you going to ignore them? And then, if you are going to help out somewhat, how much are you going to help? Right? Like, at first, the narrator's like, oh, well, you know, I can fill this out. That's not that big of a deal, whatever. Um, and I can help you even to the counter, but clearly uh, the, f the flight attendant or, or I, I'm not sure what you call the counter person in a, uh, an airport, I guess, but uh, they s s assign seats right next to each other um, for Mama Pomegranate and the narrator in a way that suggests their seats weren't assigned already. And so, unwittingly, her help has placed Mama Pomegranate with her for another several hours. Um, and then, you know, there's more things that she needs help with after that. And so it's like this reminder that, you know, people do legitimately need help. Uh, but also... It doesn't, like, say, hey, like, you did your best job and, like, you know, there's nothing more you can do because it is a realistic portrayal of someone trying to travel, the narrator, who just gets anxious and upset about being enclosed and having to go through customs and having to follow all the rules and regulations of airports and countries uh, not to mention uh, civil order uh, to your neighbors and the other people in the airports and on the flights. And she just wants to get back to her family in France. Yeah. And we don't know what happened to her before this. We don't know what she's going towards. And so, you know, that's why it's really, it's really, really anxious to read because just imagine your life and like how much like how it feels to you in your own head 
is different than how it appears to someone else in the world. And even when you try to explain that to someone else in the world, you can't do justice to exactly how it feels in your head. And so, like, are you going to, uh, you know, commit some sort of, uh, I don't know how to put this, I guess, uh, social uh, taboo mm -hmm. and tell the person off in public in a way that will make sure that they're told off and know they're told off? Or are you, tr or, or are you going to try and be polite um, and tell them off? And if that doesn't work, then what are you going to do? Um, I also think of this, I've been, I've been uh, watching a lot of Norm MacDonald recently. R.I.P. And uh, Norm MacDonald's, right, he's a stand-up, uh, was a stand-up, and he, like, he wasn't as interested in the joke. Uh, he's more interested in how far can I push this uh, supposed joke. And he will tell a story as long as possible for the smallest punchline as possible. Because that's not, the punchline is not the thing for him. He gets to create like this world where there are real stakes. And, you know, are you going to be the one who's too uh, upset that he's telling this long story to not care about the story but want and need the joke? Or are you going to be the one who will be interested in whatever made up mindless story that he's telling that has real world consequences and situations and uh, speaks to important facts, even though you came here for something completely different? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I I'd like to add that that sort of reminds me about this story. That sometimes my anxiety, like I, I'm, I feel like I'm being a little harsh on the unnamed narrator in part because like I over relate to the unnamed narrator and like how I would respond to this situation for so many reasons. And right, like I think there are there are repetitive events in the story, and there are repetitive sort of phrasings and the way that, you know the story has been constructed is sort of brilliantly introducing new small bits of information into the story, um, which feels a little bit true of talking to folks who are older and folks who are from smaller communities in moments of what I would call mixed anxiety and awe, which I think is actually what's happening to Mama Pomegranate, right? The narrator identifies her anxiety about travel. She fails to note how often Mama Pomegranate, as part of, I think sometimes she's irritated with Mama Pomegranate because Mama Pomegranate has this real sense of wonder because things horrifying and small time wonderful are happening to her that never have happened in her life. And so, right, like the airport, she's never left Yazd. So she's like, she gets on a bus, but then apparently like breaks down as the result of hitting a man and his donkey and the man dies and then she sleeps on a bus. She's 83 years old, right? Like she's come to a city for the first time in her life. We don't know how small Yazd is, but she's never been to a city environment. She like gets on an airplane. She flies. She's actually like the, the narrator is like fearful about the airplane. She's flown on airplanes before, but she's fearful of the airplane hitting some turbulence She's like worried for the other people because she's the anxious one, right? Like mom pomegranate's like riding a roller coaster about it, right? Like she's enjoying it. And so I think that there's this, for all the time she says like, oh, to have sons that, you know, want to go away. And I say, come back to Yaz, it's heaven. And why don't you come, you know, like all of that stuff. I, I think it's easy to miss the fact that she's also having one of the great adventures in her ninth decade of her life, right? Like, that's pretty, you know, and uh, it's not, 
Um, and I think that's part of the repetition too, is that like there are, we, we call it anxiety, the narrator calls it anxiety, but that anxiety is sometimes an anxiety of fear. I'm going away to a place and it might be terrible, right? I'm going away to a place and I don't know how to do it and I'm scared. I'm going away to a place and I'm feeling, you know, I'm in a place as the narrator and I, I have all these things going on, but there's also like, I'm going away to a place and holy crap, the bathrooms are small, you know? Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, gosh, I'm so glad that we um, were talking about this because I, I feel like we could almost spend this entire time talking about repetition and all the different ways it it works in this story. Um, that would be repetitious. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think one thing that I think about immediately is the airport space and the way that, you know, you don't want an airport to be totally new and baffling. Um, when you go to it, you want to understand how it works immediately. Um, it's a functional space in that way. And, you know, you don't want the order of things to be very, very different each time. Um, it's repetition works in that way, but there are also ways that the story complicates that, like that everyone gets really upset about um, the murder weapon in her suitcase and the narrator keeps trying to say like it's under the plane and not going to have access to it um, so I mean the ways in which repetition teaches and can be useful um, you know get get the lie by other moments in the story and you know at times I find Mama Pomegranate's Dear Lady grading um and other times, like, it makes me feel like I really know her. Like, if you ask me about this story 10 years from now, I'm going to remember that dear lady and hear it a little bit in my head. Um, I want to I wanna go back a little to um, arrivals and departures, though, um, because I think, you know, as much, this story is so much about repetition, it's so much about that leave taking where we choose to spend our lives. Um, another one of our Story Talk episodes covers Anya Kapoor's story, Children Are Civilians to. And in Bull's Paris Review um, interview, his interviewer notes that um, throughout Bull's work, there's an emphasis on arrivals and departures. And it's one of his real preoccupations. Um, that's really true to my experience of his work, and I think we could really say the same on Tom Cookie's stories, and, and this one included. Um, looking at just this story, um, what does it seem to be saying about departing in particular, and about leaving her on, um, given the place it is and its politics, and... Um, I guess if we could also, I feel like I'm adding a lot of different things here, but um, sort of talk about how this story dramatizes leave taking and how Honor of the New um, or Mount Pomegranate um, sort of enriches the story's relationship to leave taking. Yeah, I think she does this really. Um... Mama Pomegranate brings this really lovely thing through that sense of wonder that she has um, and introduces that into the story, right? I think often when, when we leave places, like, I mean, there's different reasons to go somewhere, right? Like, we don't know why the narrator's leaving, but to, to go to see your children, I assume there's a a generally pleasurable thing, even when it's scary. It's something to look forward to, um, even if the bond with the location, right, home, uh, brings that sadness. And I think that's always true about something, right, is, is a person who's like, I personally have a family that's lived in a lot of places, and I personally have lived in a lot of places. I find leaving really energizing and that like it usually means I'm heading somewhere to 
for an opportunity or to see someone that I haven't seen in some time. And so it's an opportunity to, to re-encounter and, and make my life feel more coherent um, and whole. I think there is something terrifying about moving through your day to day in a way though that, um, or can be something terrifying about, right? Like my life feels very whole in the little town of Yazd, but my children aren't here. And so something feels incomplete in my, my sort of fantasy world would be one in which my children come back to Yazd. And so I have everyone I need here. Um, I have my, the pomegranate tree and I have, right, like my children and I can lie with them and I can remember the continuity of their lives, which I think is really important, right? Like leaving always creates an artificial endpoint and always, travel always disrupts the possibility of linear continuity within space or demands narrative that explains the transition and i think in that way there's something deeply potent and inherently about beginning and ending in the the nature of that act and i i suspect that that's part of what what's happening with both bull um and with the pomegranate lady in part because right like if you're right Both of those books are, are books about places that during the author's lifetime went through war as a substantive change that forced migrations, that disrupted even internally uh, human relationships, both through you know, the us-them mentality of, of those times, um, through the need to be, you know, in Iran's case, more socially conservative after 1979 than prior to 1979 for the purposes of appeasing uh, the political apparatus. Um, and so I think those, those exits always have the threat that you don't come back to, that the continuity doesn't pick up ever again, um, or that you never do get to see your sons come back to Yazd. So you never get to see the completion and uh, to, to die, which is what we're all sort of like living toward and not see that completion happen. You're 83 years old. You've lived in a small village. Uh, you're reasonably obese and apparently uh, eat a lot of pomegranate syrup. Uh, and you know, like, like it's, you're traveling far, far away. Uh, your sons are taking you in. There's a, there's an implicit thing here that the pomegranate lady doesn't have a return ticket that we know of. Uh, it's one way to Sweden. And so that, that continuity is really broken. I think that's really scary about it. And so I think in some ways, uh, you know, those are, you know, Taragi and, and Bull are, are both uh, hitting on that, that possibility that you can't conclude that it never becomes the fairy tale ending. Yeah, I was going to talk about leave taking particularly in an in an airport but also if it was a car or walking away or taking a bus or taking a train as a spectacle oh yeah totally it's it's like you know for the traveler some people love traveling some people don't you know usually <laughs> you know you're one or the other it seems like and that's because new things are going to happen and you're not going to be around your comfort comfort zone and, and what makes you comfortable and it excites some people and it really horrifies others and you know the airports at this time this is uh set in the year 2000 uh you know you could actually go into the airport and kind of see the people off that were getting on planes at that time, I believe. Um, and so there's always this big thing about saying goodbye or even now, like dropping someone at the airport. It's like, oh, you know, 
on Tuesday, I got to go drop off so-and-so at the airport because they're like spending two weeks at this conference or like whatever, you know? And so like it changes the people that are staying too. whatever interaction they normally have with that person is gone for that amount of time. And if they leave forever, <laughs> you know, like what are you going to replace that amount of time that you had that you normally did things with that person with. Um, but also, think about the battle axe, right? Like, everyone is excited to see someone get in trouble because it's not its not them getting in trouble. Yes. You know, everyone wants... It's, it's Honestly, it's the same thing as, like, seeing someone do something stupid. Yeah. You're like, at least it wasn't me that did the stupid thing. Yeah. But I would do that in a heartbeat in a different, you know, circumstance. Right. Um, it's like the ability to laugh at yourself and at the foolish, maybe not foolish, maybe rigid guidelines of like what the proper thing to do is in a given situation. And I think just as a spectacle, like Mama Pomegranate is like, man, I'm going to make this as much fun as I can because I have no idea what's going on. Yeah. The narrator's like, damn it, I have to take a flight again. Yeah. I got to get back to France. I got things to do. Man, I just want to get this over with. Right? So you have those two, like, conflicting kind of situations where Mama Pomegranate, like, even when she has to pee, like, makes it kind of a game where, like, she doesn't know where the bathrooms are. She can't, she's having trouble walking on the plane. She's falling all over people, but people are helping her because that's what you do. And the narrator's just like, oh my gosh, you know, what am I going to, you know. And so those two things, uh, you know, I I think are really interesting uh, to see happen. And, you know, even when you get on a plane and you're going somewhere that you've lived or like, you know, people that are there. You look around and you're like, hey, I wonder if so-and-so is like on the flight. I wonder if so-and-so is in the terminal. Sometimes they are. And you're like, oh, hey, man, I haven't seen you forever. And it, and it becomes a spectacle that you wanted it to become. Yeah. Also, I will put in quickly, like, think about uh, the West's view of the Middle East, right? I feel like a lot of media kind of portray the Middle East or like the war in Ukraine as like this one thing that's happening without really thinking about civilians. Um, Not necessarily in Ukraine, but like in that uh, particular example, it'd be Russia. Like the Russian civilians, like they're not the ones being like, oh, we should go invade Ukraine. Um, But the point being like, the average American, for example, thinking about the Middle East is like, oh, well, there's unrest in the Middle East and we don't understand what they're doing in the Middle East and the women have to wear these clothes in the Middle East and all of these things have to be followed very strictly or, or something's going to happen. But it's always like, the idea being it's dangerous. Yeah, I think actually that I'm glad not only that you pulled away from my kind of depressing view of the possibility of never coming back, but also that you like introduced a couple things about, right? Like there's something about the the trans mutability of ourselves in those spaces and the objects that we have, right? To, right? Like when I'm in Tehran, I'm Iranian, I'm Persian, I'm here. And when I'm in the West, I'm someone else. When the battle axe is in the Iranian market, it's a souvenir being sold to tourists. And, you know, you may think of yourself as Iranian, but you're buying a tourist object. But before that fact, it was a tourist object or an antique as such. It was, right, like religiously symbolic, um, right, to someone. And... You know, even the the narrator, right, like, doesn't read Arabic and so has to presume that what's written on the the axe is Arabic. 
Um, and so that like, there's a series of operations that happen and many of them sort of actualize at the point of an airport is a place where they hugely actualize because there's someone bureaucratically sitting there going like this battle ax is historical. It's antiquity. It's a murder weapon. <laughs> it's like, you know, like, and now it's no longer a religious object, right? It's got a bureaucratic designation and what can be done with it has changed and it no longer, right? Like, and your intentions, whatever they were to buy something for my son that will connect him with his mother's culture to like, you know, to acquire a like memory of my homeland to like have a souvenir, whatever it is now become designated right and as it as it transfers it shifts in that space there is something sort of like you know the body and blood of christ when you like get communion or something that happens right like that you don't actually see it happen but the belief applied to it becomes significant and you have to deal with that designation regardless of whether or not you want to well and also like your to your point, like the person has changed too, by designation. Yeah. Like right. you, when you're at home, you're like, you know, if if something happens, you're like, oh well, I'll just call so and so. They'll help me out, right? Um, at the airport, they scrutinize you. They go through all your stuff. You know, <laughs> they know where you're coming from and where you're going to. Uh, you know, and so all these things, like they're like, well, uh, I suppose this person's all right. We yeah. we thoroughly check this person, and if we need to more thoroughly check this person, we'll take him in the back, right? Like, you know. Yeah. But you become when you do make that trip, though you're you're like you're out on your own, and and maybe no one knows who you are, yeah. and no one's going to help you because they don't know who you are. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, I think we're getting at such important things about right, we've taken in this story and just how complicated it is. Um, Adam, I think you're so right to say that very, very quietly, um, given the length of this story and how direct it is at times, um, there is the inference that the narrator may not have the freedom to go back um, mm -hmm. or if she is able to go back, she won't be going back to the same place. And, you know, the way we talk about that in language is um, a little confused anyway. I think, um, you know, we never go back to the exact same place. I mean, it's impossible. But because of the political situation that's compounded, but then, I mean, Matthew, I think you're getting at such wise things about the spectacle we make around the taking for all this story's inattentiveness to space. Um, there is a lot of attention to where people are at the moment of departure uh, and who's coming to greet people who are arriving. The story is interested in that. Um, and also in our different ways of relating to travel, even Mama Pomegranate, who rides the airplane like a roller coaster, does feel very put out to be going to see her boys and confused at, you know, why they can't just stay put. And, you know, the narrator, for all her hurry, does feel complicated to be about returning. It's not that she just wants to rush home to what she knows. Um, there are deeper feelings there that um, she doesn't quite articulate that. Yeah, I mean, she does a little bit, right? Like, she doesn't fully actualize it, but the first sentence of the story is, I hate this life of constant wandering, these eternal comings and goings, these middle-of-the-night flights dragging along my suitcase, going through customs, and the final torture, the humiliating body search. Now, I mean, there's there's something that we end with there that's a concrete bureaucratic violation of the ways that our like our persons are under the assumption any one of us is capable of doing something very cruel to the rest of us but 
Right. Like it starts out with the general statement of, I hate this life of constant wandering. Yeah. Um, that so much draws my attention as a reader. And I mean, I think what, when I, when I leave the story, something that I, I think about is that the story really does communicate what she hates about travel, but it doesn't really give us full access to what she hates about leaving Iran in particular and what her space in Iran has been. I mean, it's clearly very different from Mama Fano Granite's. Um, yeah, uh, changing gears a little bit. <laughs> oh, sure. I discovered this collection uh, listening to Michael Silverblatt's radio program before. I have discovered a few things through that. Um, program and I'd, I'd highly recommend it in general, um, though while it's on my mind there is a, an episode on um, the collection, The Pomegranate Lady and Her Sons in particular, and I just want to recommend it, it's, it's really wonderful and um, you know it features, it's an interview, it features Taraki herself and um, she's just um, such a joy to listen to. Um, in Silverblatt, um, I think eloquently, um, as usual with him, articulates something that I think is really, really essential to understand this collection. Um, I don't think it resists reality or refuses to depict things in various terms exactly. You know? The story is grounded in the simple and the ordinary in many ways. And, and, tedious things sometimes, um, but its focus isn't quite there. Um, it's not much drawn to the details of this day and this encounter like we've discussed. You know, it's not doing the Tolstoy thing of depicting objects in the room um, or really bothering itself too much with the like you were there effect. Um, and the particular ambience of at the airport and you know, all of that. Rather, this story, I think, engages another kind of story, um, a mode that's a little more engaged with, I mean, maybe oral storytelling to some extent, with myth, um, moments of transcendence, and um, a word that Silverback comes to is mystery. Um, I think it applies a little more to certain, certain stories in the collection than others. Um, and, you know, it's also a story that I think is very, um, as much as it <laughs> troubles you as a reader, I, I likely, I, I, I likely, I also feel, um, implicated in the story. I don't know that I would help Mama Pomegranate enough. Um, but I, I think it's also a very funny story. <laughs> And, um, or at least very absurdist. Um, I wonder if you guys can talk a little bit about um, moments where the tone gets a little absurd and or the action gets a little absurd. Yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, to touch on repetition and absurdity for just a moment uh, before going on, uh, one of the things about repetition is that you don't get to the point very fast, usually. And because of that, it becomes absurd sometimes to be like, well, we're gonna, the same thing's gonna happen again and again and again. And, you know, I think, especially with like, you know, the internet now, obviously people want things done quickly and very, you know, succinctly and, on or ahead of time and they get upset if I were to just continue on like this just talking for minutes and minutes <laughs> and like like that right so that's one thing that helps make it absurd uh, but you know we've got these great uh, moments where uh, the school teacher uh, is talking about Sweden and she's like, water freezes right in your mouth and tears turn into shards of glass and people go blind. 
And I said to myself, oh, God, I hope my sons haven't gone blind. (laughs) Who knows what they've been eating all this time? My husband said, quote, they eat pork. That's why they now look like women. (laughs) Right? So it's it's also looking at how people uh, from Mama Pomegranate's village, like, imagine what Sweden's like. Uh, imagine what their sons are like living over there, right? The father who's, you know, upset about pretty much everything. Yeah. It's just like, oh, and they pluck their eyebrows and like all this stuff uh, about their sons being disgraces uh, (laughs) to the family. Uh, (laughs) And like, you know, we could go on with things like that. But, um, you know, some of the absurdity is in just thinking about like the characters thinking about different spaces and people, but also thinking about people that uh, they know or they're, that they're familiar with or they're part of their family and what the West has done to those people. Yeah. Uh, I love that. I, uh, I think that is one of my favorite things, right? Like, and it also like tells you something about the way in which uh, those of us who live in the West uh, those of us who like are, you know, have lived most of our lives in the 21st century, um, like are seen by those of us who haven't, you know? Um, and then like, right. Like it's that when you get that kind of reductio ad absurdum from somebody who entirely misunderstands your world, like not only, do you find it funny, but you also realize how goofy a lot of the things you do in life are, right? Like, um, or the nature of like going through bureaucratic nightmares where like if you're actually going through them and you bought a, like a battle axe to take home as a, um, a souvenir, you would like, you know, You'd be really irritated, perhaps, if, like, somebody took your battle axe. Uh, but, you know, when you're not in that situation, you're watching someone else, to your point, Matthew, right? Like, watching other people go through, sort of, like, do something stupid makes you feel better about yourself. Uh, but there are also a couple moments that just the repetition and the, like, oddity, right? Like, the fish out of water, right? The crocodile Dundee kind of thing is often funny to us, Right. So at one point, um, we're in Charles de Gaulle Airport, and Mama Pomegranate is seeing her first set of escalators, and she's got to go down the escalator. And I love this. It's so quiet, but like the narrator says, Mama Pomegranate is startled. Her eyes grow wide. Oh, dear lady, the stairs are moving. I'm staying put. Let's find another way. Let's go that way. There are proper stairs, like our own. I won't go this way. I'll fall and die. Oh, stop fussing and keep quiet. Otherwise, I'll leave you right here and go. I'm exhausted, and I've run out of patience. Mama, what in the world are you going to Sweden for? I snap. You will be miserable. You will die of sorrow. I'm angry and I don't know who to blame. And I think in some ways that moment, right? Like in real life, if you're the person to helping Mama Pomegranate, you're really angry. And then there's that immediate guilt reaction. Like this poor woman doesn't know what she's doing. She's older. She's scared I'm being a dick. But also there's something, it's that like fish out of water thing, like where escalators are scary. Like this kind of like normal thing to us is scary. But also seeing the reaction to that, like someone brought to being sort of like absurdly cranky about someone who doesn't understand. The whole thing like ends up being this kind of dark sense of funny in that way for me. And like anxiety producing also, but shortly after, before that, right? Like we get these little, to Ingrid's point, Kafka-esque moments, right? Like where all the wheelchairs have been reserved in advance and because the narrator both like, you know, hasn't planned on being Mama Pomegranate's aide, and Mama Pomegranate doesn't understand any of this, there's no reservation of a wheelchair for her, 
and like where the bureaucrats can't just like figure out, well, what do you do? So they leave Mama Pomegranate sitting on the floor and her legs have quote unquote frozen um, from the, the stiffness of the flight. And so, you know, prior to this, right, like Mama Pomegranate, she gets, the narrator gets Mama Pomegranate sit it on or set on a like trolley. A, a trolley with her bags, but Mama Pomegranate's kind of big. So like she's tipping it and the narrator's trying to like wheel it. Mama Pomegranate's having fun and has like splayed her legs out like into the air so they don't drag. But like the whole image of Mama Pomegranate is a pomegranate shaped person like comes to the fore and this kind of like airplane image of her like I think that stuff, it's like, it goes by, you know, you, you almost miss it for the anxiety, but it's so, like, you know, like, giddily strange. She's she's also carrying multiple kilos of <laughs> eggplant. <laughs> multiple kilos of eggplant. And, like, she's also got pomegranates and, like, several other things. Right. Because she's the pomegranate lady. Yeah. And she's like, I'm going to bring my stuff and cook my sons a good meal. And, you know, the other thing that's absurd is that 90 to 95% of the story is basically set in an airport or on an airplane. (laughs) And it's absurd because it's a very enclosed space. Like, and so you imagine the last time you had a bad experience in an airport and you're like, oh, I was enraged because like, (laughs) I couldn't, like, I missed my plane. Like the next plane's not till tomorrow. Like... You know, they're not going to comp me a hotel. I got to stay in the airport. Like, you know, all these things. And you're like, oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. I I think we're all, like, getting at the heart of the story and what's so strange about it. I don't know about the two of you. It sounds like you felt the anxiety of the story reading it and... I mean, the story does kind of push you in that way, in that, you know, it is it is drawn out. It's a long story. Um, and it makes sure that, you know, if you're that person who would be okay with helping with the customs farm and not worrying about it too much, that it takes it farther and farther and farther. And you're drawn deeper and deeper and deeper. And you're reminded that sometimes at the end of travel, you're hungry. And you just want to get home and you're tired. Um, and maybe this person who sees an escalator and doesn't know what it is, that charm will wear off and her squeezing her pomegranate near your white coverall might stress you out a little. Um, but I think, you no. Know, I, I had this feeling with this story, especially like having some time in between my first and second read where like, once I understood what it was and I was sort of out of it. Yeah. Um, and now that I'm in a space where I'm talking about it with you, like it only gets funnier. Yeah. Um, it's got this kind of slapstick, like I love Lucy or like Charlie Chaplin kind of vibe to it where you're like, Oh God, she's, <laughs> she's doing what now? Um, and I mean, it's not, through cleverness exactly, I, I don't know, some of it's maybe the relief of it not being you <laughs> to some yeah. extent. Um, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but the absurdity of it does really get me. Uh, like These moments that we've brought up are, are funnier to me now than they were <laughs> on first read. Yeah, I think that it does. I used the term verisimilitude earlier, and I think there is a real you know, like dedication to this world being accurate to a real world environment. And so in that way, it does have that effect you're talking about, right? Like that retelling the story makes it easier to deal with, but also turns the the wildness funnier, right? Like, Yeah, I mean, even thinking about her shape and like we haven't brought up all her layers and that she's sweating too. <laughs> um, she's heard that Sweden is cold, so she's wearing all of her wool. <laughs> oh, wow. it's, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of little things that add up to very fun. Um, but 
changing years again. Um, you know, I, I know both of you are fairy tale review editors, and I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Um, does this story um, borrow from fairy tales at all in that tradition? First of all, I feel this is a loaded question. Seriously uh, loaded question. <laughs> I think a lot of my questions are a little loaded. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it does. Uh, particularly Mama Pomegranate's origin story. Um, that's like the easiest one. Uh, she says, I was raised under a pomegranate tree. She says, I had no father and no mother. I drank pomegranate juice instead of mother's milk. I would pull down a branch and squeeze a pomegranate and suck out its juice. I thought it was my mother's breast. People would say, Anorak, little pomegranate, this tree is your mother. It is the tree of love. And they would point to the sycamore tree, Chanarak, I'm sorry, butchering these, next to it and say, this is your father. And that is how I found a mother and a father. One day I went to get my identity card and the man in the office said, what's your name? I said, Anorak. He said, what's your father's name? I said, Janarok, little sycamore. He said, get lost. Were you born from a tree? I said, yes. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, one of our, uh, uh, fellow editors, fellow teachers, uh, Kate Bernheimer, uh, you know, has written about fairy tales quite a bit and, you know, she, she's got an essay uh, called Fairy Tale is Form, Form is Fairy Tale. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, pretty important one. Uh, and like, sh she lays out her argument for uh, fairy tales as things that, like, some of the things that fairy tales include are flatness, abstraction, intuitive logic, and normalized magic. So, to an extent, I think. Uh, you could make that argument that all of those things are true, except maybe abstraction. I don't find a lot of abstraction in this um, because it it's so, it's kind of a, like, it's a realized story. It's like a real trip uh, outside of, like, her origin story. Everything else is pretty much, like, realistic. Yeah. Um, I think that's true. And then I'd also say that like mom and pomegranate's origin story is the only incidence of magic in this world. And in fact, the, the realism, you know, I mentioned this earlier, the realism is fairly dedicated. Um, and so while mama pomegranate has an extreme claim, uh, it doesn't end up unless you buy that the pomegranate of love that she gives the narrator has some sort of magical significance and that's entered into the story, which I think is, you know, uh, arguably sort of a fabulous thing, right? Like mostly the story wants to, I know we're going to get into the ending, but like wants us to deal with the horror of what realism is more than it wants us to deal with the magic and resolution um, that fairy tales sometimes provide. Um, I think in that way, right, like the way in which this connects to a tradition of fairy tales is A, right, like there's something a little bit travels of John Mandeville about these stories, uh, both in the sense that like the stories are travelogues of a kind, right? We start out with, as you mentioned, Ingrid, like the label of where we're at being in an airport. Um, but then we get these narratives of the kind of extreme characters and extreme things that you would see in, right, like you, the reader, can kind of giggle at Mr. Parrot and how absurd it is to be calling an axe in and of itself a murder weapon, um, right? Um, and then inversely, right, like you can laugh at Mama Pomegranate's interpretations of, right, like she's bringing so many kilos of eggplant because the teacher told her that the eggplant doesn't grow in Sweden because it's so cold. And so she doesn't think that she can get eggplant in Sweden. And so she's just packed them. Um, I think also, right, like in terms of sort of Persian and Middle Eastern fairy tales, right, like the, the big sort of like gold 
brick um, of that is the the many many variations on the thousand and one nights, right? Um, and part of that is because the thousand and one nights were an, an Islamic golden era sort of tradition that you know still really isn't codified as a uniform like this is the dedicated version of it. And, you know, like I'm reminded by this story in a lot of ways, sort of like variations on Sinbad, um, right? Like Sinbad goes and does remarkable things out in the world, but it's often told as Sinbad is telling the story to a character named often Hinbad. Um, and, but like Sinbad's just like this guy who sort of like, in some ways, you know, because it's a, a sort of fairy tale telling and because there's a sort of respect culture around it, like Sinbad kind of pays Hinbad to just sit there every day. Like he's sort of forcing him by his poverty using wealth to like make Hinbad sit there just so he has someone to tell <laughs> these crazy stories to. And so it's entirely possible that Sinbad, you know, if it were told as a realist story, we would see that Sinbad like, was just a boring ass trader, not like this guy that like went and encountered the rock and all of this sort of stuff, right? Um, and I think there's something about that, right? Only it's sort of inverted because the pomegranate lady has all these wild ideas and this like huge thing in her mind, uh, and she's forced, uh, you know, this more westernized woman to like stay with her and like hear her story by force of sort of like guilt as she moves through sort of capitalist bureaucratic spaces that are like interrupting her world by drawing her sons away or whatever um and i so I, I think in those ways yeah like they're totally influenced by fairy tale i i really wouldn't call this a fairy tale in and of itself yeah i i completely agree um I think I noticed aspects of it that felt like uh, maybe it had spent some time with the form or, um, you know, it was like a little bit in conversation with the form, uh, but it doesn't work exactly like a more traditional tale um, in the ways that you've already articulated. And I, it's magic, especially is not a fairy tale kind of magic. Um, and I think it's much more mythic. Um, and, you know, I, I think one thing I thought about was like the, the tradition of a magical helper. Mm. Um, but usually that magical helper wouldn't have the same kind of like reluctance and volition. Um, and, you know, usually the tale would be a little more focused on on the character who's journeying and who has a kind of, um, I don't know, like magical goal for lack of a better term. And, you know, I mean, I even thought a little bit about the repetition in terms of um, the fairy tale form, but again, that's, that's slightly different too. With the fairy tale, you know, we'd often have like one brother trying to do you know perform a particular task and then another brother trying and then another um and the third time you get it um that kind of thing and here there's much more variance in terms of the absurd um obstacles that come up um yeah so i hope you guys when, when you're in a fairy tale like you know you're in a fairy tale like it's it's hard to kind of like put into words uh i think but like you're literally transported from the realistic world that you're used to, even if it's kind of slightly or somewhat like the realistic world. You feel as if you are elsewhere or if other things are possible that aren't normally possible. That's well put. Um, so I think having like better defined um, you know, what the story is and what it isn't. Um, I'm wondering if we could talk a little more about um, interwoven myth and especially imagined scene. Um, some of them are kind of brief in this story, but 
you know, across um, Tahaki's collection, um, there is a lot of vision, right? a lot of um, kind of, yeah, I imagine seeing between characters, something that doesn't happen, but does seem to kind of happen in thought in a way that is different from just ordinary thought. Um, so I guess we've already contextualized um, where um, Mama Pomegranate's name comes from. And I mean, her name is a direct translation. It's not, um, you know, her traditional nickname in that way. Her name is Mama Pomegranate, or the Pomegranate Lady. Um, can we talk a little bit about um, her pomegranates of love, though? And I guess how the story um, balances reality and irreality. And, you know, some of these more visionary or imagined moments with the mundane. Yeah, I mean, I think that, right, the, the whole story, as we've talked about a lot, has... Um, Right, it's a it's a story about a transnational experience, and in some ways, uh, transnational lives, um, and the impossibility of escaping um, that fact for many of us. Right, um, a sort of like cosmopolitan world, um, or all of us in different ways. But um, you know, I think that in that way, any time that you're not with the people you want to be with, um, you have to imagine the encounter, right? If you value re-encountering them, if you believe in re-encountering them, you know, whether that's, you know, shit, I'm at work today and I like kind of want to go see my dog. and <laughs> Like, I, you know, this is, I hope it's, you know, warm outside when I get there, whether it's, you know, imagining you know, death as a, like, as a heaven where you're going to go and you'll be together again with your loved ones, or whether it's thinking about the smell of your son's feet, uh, you know, um, those are, I think in, for many of us, much of the time necessities to, to survival and hope, uh, within, you know, the context of the difficulties of our lives. And, and so a lot of that imagination is built on, the idea of not the moment of departure, but the moment of arrival in the story. Um, and because the story's sense of realism is dedicated to never actualizing the arrival, in fact, there's one main break in the story that's delineated uh, in our copy by just a, not only a page break, but a, a little illustration of a leaf. Um, we don't actually like at the beginning get a location marker we don't so we don't know where the narrator ends up we know that she's made it home we know that she has the pomegranate of love which was a gift from mama pomegranate to her you know it could have been that moment of the magical helper but she denied that moment she didn't mama pomegranate was rubbing with her unusually strong hands the pomegranate in order to get the juice of the pomegranate of love out um, which I, I guess to your earlier question speaks to the possibility that this is a fairy tale that could have been, right? Mm -hmm. If if she'd accepted the pomegranate of love, maybe things would have been different, right? In fairy tales, often there are rules to how you do the thing. Um, she doesn't accept the pomegranate of love. She's just cranky with Mama Pomegranate. And uh, so she doesn't really get the rewards of that. She gets the sort of psycho torture. It's a little bit Rumpelstiltskin in that way. Um, but yeah, I think that that's the, right. It's the imagined in some ways. I think she doesn't accept the pomegranate of, this is like an overly strict interpretation, but I think she doesn't accept the pomegranate of love. So we neither break into the fairy tale. We just had a sort of minor horror encounter. Now she's left with the psychodrama of only fantasy about what happens to mama pomegranate, um, after they depart. Um, but also, and she has to build those fantasies out of Mama Pomegranate's fantasy. So it's, it's layers of fantasy on fantasy um, that take away from the real world locations of the narrative. But I think that's tied to that pomegranate of love for sure. So I think that's a good question about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, you know, what happens at the end 
uh, I'm going to kind of tie into this because I think Adam did a great job on that question. Um, is, is that, you know, she gets home and she realizes there's, uh, she still has Mama Pomegranate's ticket to Gothenburg. Uh, I think that's correct. Yeah. Or Gothenburg. I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, one, of, one of the other probably. <laughs> um, anyway, meaning, like, when she helped Mama Pomegranate uh, get this porter that she paid to help her get to her flight, she would never have been able to get on the flight because she had no ticket. And so she gets home and unpacks everything after three days and like settles in and realizes she has the ticket still. And so she like frantically calls around to airports, to embassies, uh, you know, trying to find out uh, if the lady was on the flight, if uh, trying to get in touch with her sons, you know, she can't find anything. And so it's just this idea that it all worked out that's her hope right that's her fantasy as as you've said adam and you know part of her fantasy includes like <laughs> she says quote i tell myself that one day one good and happy day i will return and i will buy a house with a small garden that faces the sun and has a view of the mountains i will plant the seeds of the good lady's pomegranate and i will divide its fruit among the people in the neighborhood those who taste the pomegranate of love will know that they are brothers and sisters, right? So, like, this is a return to Iran and, like, doing this, this thing that is supposedly selfless, but really that, that wouldn't be selfless to do that. That would be to try to, like, feel better about how she treated Mama Pomegranate and never knowing, like, the end of the story, right? There's no arrival for Mama Pomegranate. And, you know, it almost, the story almost is like, maybe she wasn't real. And maybe I made this up because a lot of the narrator's ideas about Mama Pomegranate happen while she's sleeping. And so then it's like, well, you know, you could make an argument like that. I don't think that's what the story is trying to do, but you could make that argument. Um, and so, you know, I don't know that she has changed significantly. Uh, I think more so she has changed slightly to kind of be more interested in and receptive of stories and listening to people and thinking about, uh, her heritage and her home and, you know, maybe the importance of doing the right thing in her family, but yet, mm, it's kind of a hard ending. Yeah, it's brutal. This is way brutal. Um, yeah. Why do you find it to be brutal, Adam? Yeah, I think that there's there's a lot of weighted stuff there. Right, like, um, amongst Muslims, it's fairly common to refer to each other as brother or sister, right, within the context of the Umrah, right, like the, the sort of community um, of people. Uh, and we, we see that earlier in the story, right, um, that people, like, there are a couple people are referred to as sisters. Um, and... And so some of that, I think that ending is a literalization of the idea that there would be some sort of unity built out of this pomegranate fantasy, that people who ate out of it would see a connection, which I think probably speaks to sort of internal unity um, within the context of Iran and, and you know, uh, its spaces, um, but also... You know, I think it's also brutal, right? Like, we don't know what happens to Mama Pomegranate. Uh, I hadn't thought so much about Mama Pomegranate being unreal um, or magical, but it is true that, like, there are literalized scenes of Mama Pomegranate and her sons in the narrator's dreams while she's on the flight. Uh, and there's something surreal about her. Um, 
But I think also, right, the possibility that she is real, which is the one that I sort of drive with, uh, leaves her in a real predicament that probably works out eventually one way or the other, but that puts her through a real, you know, trying experience at best, a traumatic experience, uh, too dangerous experience at worst. Um, and right, like there is something sort of horrifying about accepting intentionally or unintentionally culpability of care in, in anyone's life. Um, and then, right, like it's one more reminder in the bureaucratic context that, um, the world has become so big and bureaucratized that both you can't just call the airport and say, did this woman named Mama Pomegranate make her way to Sweden to her sons? Uh, both because so many people come in and out of an airport that who's going to know for sure, right? Unless the legend of Mama Pomegranate came to bear. Um, but also that like, for the most part, you just can't call any sort of bureaucratic or regulated space and say, is so-and-so there? I met them on a plane. Can I please like have their whereabouts? Um, which, you know, speaks to the sort of fear in the world and the like dangers of the world and the ways in which like some of us have harmed others of us in a way that we can't go through the world just assuming that like it's okay all the time to like answer questions. I think that like that's a pretty pessimistic interpretation of the world that gets presented there, right? That the fantasy, as Matthew points out, is a really beautiful fantasy that speaks to the trauma and the sadness and the sort of like imperfections of the world that the narrator actually lives in. Um, yeah, I think, I think you guys have touched so beautifully on this ending. And it's, what's so complicated about it? Um, you know, I think we do get this myth and I mean, it is born out of this sense of guilt, first and foremost, as Matthew's pointed out, um, you know, this narrator who was reluctant to help this woman realizes that, you know, she, she wants to blame Mama Pomegranate, but she realizes that she took her ticket and that she caused problems for Mama Pomegranate logistically. Um, and the fantasy grows out of that. Um, I mean, I think I, I, I would say, though, that um, maybe as a cheerier reader in our group, that um, yeah. I think I do see some change even out of that guilt, um, that the fantasy has a real humanity about it and a kind of well-wishing about it, but I don't think it's only about her, her anymore and that she's so much engaged with Mama Pomegranate's space, even in the abstract. Um, I, I think the, the idea of the dream thing is it's really interesting that um, that also hadn't occurred to me, and I don't think the story pushes that, but um, Mama Pomegranate does have this kind of unreal quality about her. You're so right. And, um, you know, even in that final address, um, the narrator's kind of sleepy and she's imagining this possibility and still hearing Mama Pomegranate and realizing that Mama Pomegranate is probably still thinking of her, yeah. that, you know, the harm that she's caused and the way in which she was part of Mama Pomegranate's story um, is permanent in that, like, you know, if, if you're lost as a traveler and someone helps you in a really significant way, it becomes, you know, a big memory of that travel for you. Um, I think she realizes the impression she's made. And then the story ends with kind of like almost the filmic equivalent of a fade out. Um, where she's falling asleep, but Mama Pomegranate's image is also fading away. Um, in a way that she doesn't expect that she'll fade out of Mama Pomegranate's image. So it's a little kind of funny and consistent in that way. Um, but I think, 
in terms of how that reality and irreality sit side by side, I think the story, which is dealing so much with tedium throughout, ends in this really, I mean, almost too mythical space. <laughs> um, and that, like, I think it, you know, veers toward corniness and misses. Yeah, no, I mean, like, she hopes that she, everyone else will drink the pomegranate of love. You know, and that's pretty good. Um, no, any other thoughts or should we end there? Yeah, drink it out, man. Okay, thanks so much, guys, for talking about this one with me. Thank thanks. You,